Hello, everyone. I'm Billy. And I'm Comron. Welcome to the Horse Frog Podcast, home of your two favorite professional digressors and the creators of the Malazan Brotherhood. Today, we'll be discussing Book 1, Chapter 6 of Memories of Ice, a novel in the Malazan Books of the Fallen. This is Part 12. I'm sorry. I, I don't know why I'm fascinated with this. This is Part 1 of our coverage of this chapter. It's kind of like 5 in Monty Python. You are fixated on having a 12-part chapter coverage. <laughs> I am. And the record is 4 at this point. <laughs> right. I say I want a 12-parter. I know I really don't, but good gracious. <laughs> That'd be a monster of a chapter. Oh. This podcast series is intended to be a companion to reading or listening to the books set in the Malazan universe. It's not a book review, and it is most definitely not intended to be a replacement to reading the books. Both Billy and I know Preach. this to be the best fantasy story ever written and want to share our love of the series with you. We will be covering the events of the books in a linear fashion. There will be spoilers for those that have not read the books. We'll try not to spoil anything prior to us covering that portion of that respective book. And since we're just beginning, we're both working very, very hard to keep it as spoiler free as possible. Yes. And I have had to do minimal, if none, on the censorship front this book. I think we've been pretty good. Awesome. A quick warning. Today's episode contains topics not suitable for young listeners. Discretion is advised. Our show is listener supported, and if you'd like to support us, we'd really appreciate that. You can do so by visiting our Patreon link on our website at horsefrogproductions.com. Currently, we're posting ad-free episodes on Patreon weekly. Also, we'd really like to hear from you. Send any feedback or comments to contact at horsefrogproductions.com. We have an addition today. One of our listeners that follows us on Twitter, the SIO, sent us an interesting article about a recent hippo attack in Zambia. And for those wondering why I'm interested in hippos, a while ago, <laughs> Billy and I were discussing what type of soul taken or divers we'd be. Billy said some type of big cat, and I said I'd be a divers of hippos. Which is horrifying. Billy, what type of cat did you say you would be? I would go for big, you know, lion. But, you know, after seeing and talking about the hippos thing, dude, I, why is this not done? That's one of the most horrific ideas, I think. That's almost worse than like a divers of like dragons or something like that, you know? Mm -hmm. In Elden Ring, I know this isn't a shapeshifter, but they actually have these crazy hippos that... <laughs> They're almost like <laughs> golden porcupines, too. It's hard to explain. They look like a hippo, and then these spikes shoot out of them. Really cool-looking enemy. Oh. <laughs> All right, so on to this attack. Some things stuck out to me in this article. These people were canoeing, canoeing, in waters that are part of the hippo's habitat. And if you've ever seen any videos of a hippo chasing a motorized tour boat, you'll understand why I think this is an issue. There's no amount of paddling that you're going to be able to do to outrun these things. They're extremely territorial <sighs> and fast while in the water. Yeah. It's kind of like going to go check on Piranha personally on a feeding frenzy and swimming with them in an open wound and being like, I, I'm going to go get away. It's like, no, dude. It's like, what's, I, I don't get it why these people insist on doing this. That's kind of like. I'm sorry, is it wrong to say that people kind of have it coming if you get attacked when you go and invade these people, these animals' territory? I have to think that if this tour is used to going in these waters, they must not think it's that big of a threat. And maybe it doesn't happen that often where these canoe trips get okay. attacked by hippos. Regardless, it's not just the hippos. They also have those crazy crocodiles over there, too. They're like 20 feet yeah. long. I think the hippos are the larger of the two <laughs> threats, but still. There's plenty of issues. Ooh. People fall out of canoes all the time. You don't want to be in the water with these things. Oh, yeah. Now, in this case, the hippo basically battle rammed the canoe. The guy said he never saw the thing in this whole attack. He was taken to the bottom, thrown 10 feet in the <laughs> air, thrown to the shore. I think it came after him again. He ended up having a 10-inch laceration in his torso. His thigh was all messed up. He dislocated his shoulder. They rushed him to the hospital, and the nurse couldn't believe that he was still alive because every other hippo victim apparently has come in dead already. So the guy was super lucky. Right? Yeah, it sounds like it. Yeah, so <laughs> I was just thinking, it's amazing how sometimes the human body is so resilient, and then at other times, it's almost like, a slight bump on the head in the wrong way and you're done. Yeah, it is mind boggling because I, I know a couple of folks from many, many, many decades ago that died from what, you know, is a relatively minor head wounds when you see things like this in comparison to being mauled by a hippo or a shark. Oh, the craziest story I heard from this Mr. Ballin guy is a man who was mauled by a shark and by a tiger on the same day. It's like, <laughs> that can't be true. <laughs> 
it is true. true. It is true. Oh my God. That's true. That's true. This man is a surfer. He's attacked in the water. Did he also get hit by lightning on the way? No, no. What he did is he's bit bad in the leg. He gets in the car. He's going to drive. He's, he's They're in Australia. And so he realizes that it, it may not have been a tiger, but it's a, one of the big cats. And so he, I mean, he's driving. Try, it's two hours to the Dagum Hospital, and he passes out from loss of blood. He wakes up in his car or outside of his car and then realizes that he is outside of his car and there's a bunch of big cats around him. And then they start having a go at him. And he finally manages to crawl back in the car. Somebody sees this going on from another tour group and they rescue this guy. But yes, he was in fact <laughs> bitten by a shark and attacked by a group of large cats in the same day. Do they have large cats in Australia? Was this South Africa? Maybe it's South Africa. Probably okay. South Africa. Sorry. The reason I say South Africa is because they have all those great white sharks down there. And then yes. that's the only place I can think of that's near there that has big cats for sure. Yeah. Off the top of my head, I can't think if they have any big cats in Australia. I don't think they do. That might be one of the few that they don't have. Let me look while we're... I'll tell you what, they got one I'm on the loose kinda... in Texas that escaped a zoo in Mexico and <laughs> crossed the wow. river. <laughs> I did not know that. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> All right. <laughs> oh, my God. Thank That's you crazy. for reaching out to us, SIO. We appreciate it. We appreciate you listening. Yes, appreciate it. All right, Chapter 6. The chapter begins with an excerpt from Cool Barat's Vision by Horal Thum. Quote, where they tread, blood follows. End quote. And this does not set a positive tone for the upcoming chapter. No. It sounds kind of foreboding, shall we say? Yeah. <laughs> Every heading always does that, though. Sets the tone. I will also point out that Blood Follows is the first story in the first volume of Boshelaine and Corbal Brooch short stories that Mr. Erickson released. I have the books of those short stories. And just for a little something fun to read, maybe I'll give them a shot. You said they were kind of darkly humorous, right? Mm -hmm. I guess it paints Boshelaine and Corbal Brooch a little bit differently than we see them here. because. Here, we're seeing them from a little bit far away, whereas that is dealing directly with them. It's more intimate <laughs> in that regard. Right. And in reference to our question just a real minute ago, there are no big cats in Australia. Okay. Thank you for confirming. And you are welcome, sir. The bridge and the canal leading up to Saltoan's Sunset Gate were both in serious need of repair. Saltoan had once stood alongside the River Catlin, growing rich on the cross-continent trade until the river changed its course in the span of a single, rain-drenched spring. The canal was built in an effort to re-establish the river trade. The effort had seen only marginal success, and the 400 years since that time had witnessed a slow, inexorable decline. And this was one of those scenarios where I appreciate the world building that yeah. Mr. Erickson is doing here. It really helps me understand how he thinks about these worlds to come up with a backstory for why the city is the way it is. Yeah, those small details, that's what's really, that's what really makes it such a more living, breathing world. Yeah, because it feels like the city almost is a character. Yeah, very much so. Gruntle's scowl deepened upon seeing Saltoan's low, thick walls ahead. He could already smell the raw sewage. There were plenty of figures lining the battlements, but few, if any of them, were actual constabulary or soldiers. The city had sent its vaunted horse guard north to join Caladan Brood's forces in the war against the Malazan Empire. What remained of its army wasn't worth the polish on their boots. He glanced back as Karuli's carriage clattered onto the causeway. Sitting on the driver's bench, Harlow waved. At his side, Stani held the traces and Gruntle could see her lips moving to a stream of curses and complaints. Harlow's wave wilted after a moment. <laughs> These two are such a juxtaposition of each other. Harlow always seems to be in a cheery mood, and I doubt Stani has been happy for a single minute <laughs> in her entire life. I love how every group has to have people like these in real life. I mean, I am of the uh, the Harlow people, and uh, I, a woman or three that I work with could be of the Stani persuasion. <laughs> <laughs> Gruntle returned his attention to Sunset Gate. There were no guards in sight and little in the way of traffic. The two huge wooden doors hung ajar and looked not to have been closed in a long time. His mood soured even further and he slowed his horse until the carriage drew alongside him. Stani asked, We're passing right through, right? Straight through to Sunrise Gate, right? Gruntle said, So I have advised. Stani said, What's the point of our long experience if the master won't heed our advice? Answer me that, Gruntle! <laughs> 
Gruntle shrugged. No doubt Karuli could hear every word, and no doubt Stani knew that. They approached the arched entrance. The avenue within quickly narrowed to an alley buried beneath the gloom of the flanking building's upper levels, which almost touched overhead. Gruntle moved ahead of the carriage again. Mangy chickens scattered from their path, but the fat black rats in the gutters only momentarily paused in their feasting on <laughs> rotting rubbish to watch the carriage wheels slip past. Harlow said, we'll be scraping sides in a moment. Gruntle said, if we can manage twist face passage, we'll be all right. Harlow said, aye, but that's a big if, Gruntle. Mind you, there's enough that passes for grease on these walls. <laughs> that sounds like a wonderful place to visit. <laughs> Is this next door to the inn that slopes down in the middle with the big bowl area <laughs> that Kalam found himself in? Remember that nasty, <laughs> nasty place? <laughs> yeah, it sounds like the walls are effectively what was on the floor in that tavern yeah. that he visited. <laughs> I think it was in Erlatan. <laughs> yes. Oh, well, no, I think that was when they, ma yeah, when they made it to Aaron. Yeah, you're right. The alley narrowed ahead to the choke point known as Twist Face Passage. Countless trader wagons had gouged deep grooves in both walls. Broken spokes and torn fittings littered the cobbles. The neighborhood had a wrecker's mentality, Gruntle well knew. Any carriage trapped in the passage was free salvage, and the locals weren't averse to swinging swords if their claims were contested. Gruntle had only spilled blood here once, six or seven years back. A messy night, he recalled. He and his guards had depopulated half a tenement block of cutthroats and thugs before they'd managed to back the wagon out of the passage, remove the wheels, lay rollers, and manhandle their way through. He did not want a repetition. The hub scraped a few times as they passed through the choke point, but then, with a swearing stani and a grinning harlow ducking beneath sodden clothes hanging from a line, they were clear and into the square beyond. No deliberate intent created Woo's closet square. The open space was born of the happenstance convergence of 13 streets and alleys of various breadth. The inn to which they all once led no longer existed, having burned down a century or so ago, leaving a broad, uneven expanse of flagstones and cobbles that had, unaccountably, acquired the name of Wu's Closet. Given the backstory of the significance of Wu to both Erickson and Esselmont, I have to wonder if there's some inside joke in regards to the name Wu's Closet. <laughs> I'm functioning on the assumption that it is, in fact, an inside joke. Probably something happened. They might have even done the story for what caused that end to burn down. <laughs> right? I wouldn't be surprised. That was probably a campaign. <laughs> that was probably a campaign. <laughs> uh, also, 13 streets converging. What a mess that would cause. So, um, your average Texas highway construction near any big city here. <laughs> <laughs> you say that it's real bad here. The worst intersection I've ever witnessed in my life in the United States was in Phoenix. Okay. Phoenix is generally a grid, perfect grid, but okay. there's one road that goes diagonal. It's a big road. I want to say it's six to eight lanes wide. Okay. Wow. And there's an intersection that has two roads going north, south, and east, west, and then this one going diagonal and <laughs> railroad tracks all intersecting each other. Wow. I've never seen, even in my visiting other countries mm. in Africa or in the Middle East, I have never seen an intersection that looked like this with all the lights hanging. And Yo, the amount of time we had to wait at this, it was right. crazy. Garland had a couple of odd ones. I lived for 35 years in Garland, and it always felt like Garland, you know, I, I moved there right about the time it started to join to Dallas. So you have these, you had several odd five ways. And then there is a couple of where there's a double stoplight because of the fact there's two major roads coming in. One of them is Garland Road. The other was it's, it, and then another major road, Jupiter, and then some railroad tracks. And so there's some kind of similar in Garland, but it wasn't that difficult to get through unless you were working in the morning and had to do the, you know, the morning drive. The morning commute was always never, ever good on that road. <laughs> it's always a nightmare. Yeah. Gruntle gestured and said, take Mukosin Street, Stani. Stani growled. I remember well enough. God's the stink. <laughs> a score of urchins had discovered their arrival and now trailed the carriage like flightless vultures. None spoke. Still in the lead, Gruntle walked his horse into Mukosin Street. He saw a few faces peer out from grimy windows, but there was no other traffic. He thought, not here, not ahead. This isn't good. Harlow called out, Captain. Gruntle did not turn. He said, I, Harlow said, them kids, they've just vanished. Gruntle loosened his cutlasses and said, right. Load your crossbow, Harlow. Harlow said, already done. Gruntle thought, I know, but why not announce it anyway? Mm. 
Twenty paces ahead, three figures stepped into the street. Gruntle squinted. He recognized the tall woman in the middle and said, Hello, Nectara. I see you've expanded your holdings. The scar-faced woman smiled and said, Why, it's Gruntle and Harlow. And who else? Oh, would that be Stani Manakis? No doubt as unpleasant as ever, my dear. Though I still lay down my heart at your feet. Stani drawled, unwise. I never step lightly. Nectara's smile broadened and she said, And you do make that heart race, love, every time. Gruntle asked, What's the toll? as he drew his mount to a halt ten paces from Nectara and her two silent bodyguards. Nectara's brows rose. She said, Toll, not this time, Gruntle. We're still in Garno's holdings. We've been granted passage. We're simply here by way of escort, Gruntle asked. Escort? The sound of the carriage's shutters clattering open made Gruntle turn. He saw Karuli's hand appear, then languidly wave him over. Gruntle dismounted. He reached the carriage's side door, peered in to see Karuli's round, pale face. Karuli said, Captain, we are to meet with this city's rulers. Gruntle asked, The king and his council? Why? A soft laugh interrupted him. Karuli said, No, no, Saltoan's true rulers. At great expense, and through extraordinary negotiation, a gathering of all the hold masters and mistresses has been convened, to whom I shall make address this night. You have leave to permit the escort just offered. I assure you, all is well. Gruntle asked, Why didn't you explain all this earlier? Karuli said, I was not certain that the negotiations were successful. The matter is complex, for it is the masters and mistresses who have asked for assistance. I, in turn, must endeavor to earn their confidence, to the effect that I represent the most efficacious agent to provide said assistance. Gruntle thought, you? Then who in Hood's name are you? He said, I see. All right, then. Trust these criminals if you like, but I'm afraid we'll not be sharing your faith. Karuli said, understood, Captain. Gruntle returned to his horse. Collecting the reins, he faced Nectar and said, lead on. Saltoan was a city with two hearts, their chambers holding different hues of blood, but both equally vile and corrupt. <laughs> I love the way he describes the ruling class here. It is incredible. Yeah, I agree. And what's so funny and sad is I almost believe this statement can apply to most modern politics, especially American politics right now. You know, any, any time. I think it's everywhere. Yeah. Uh, the more I'm seeing... <laughs> Yeah, it's it's worldwide, dude. dude it's not just yeah. us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it, 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 it's it's bad. One of my favorite guys I listened to talked about. And he, this man's been dead for a long time. Like I said, he says some things like, "Because any man that wants to run for president it needs to have his head examined." <laughs> It's, it's and they, there is there is some truth to that. It's like, why would you want to do that? <laughs> you seen the before and after pictures of all the presidents? Oh, they look yeah. like they aged twenty years. Ooh, yes, sir. Heavy lays the crown. Yeah. Seated with his back to the wall of the crowded tavern, Gruntle looked out on a motley collection of murderers, extortionists, and thugs whose claim to power was measured in fear. Stani leaned against the wall to Gruntle's left, Harlow sharing the bench on his right. Nectara had dragged her chair in a small round table close to Stani. Thick coils of smoke rose from the hookah before the hold mistress, wreathing her knife-kissed features in the cloying, tarry fumes. With the hookah's mouthpiece in her left hand, her other hand was on Stani's leather-clad thigh. Karuli stood in the center of the room, facing the majority of the crime lords and ladies. He had begun his speech in a voice soft and perfectly modulated. I am pleased to be present at this auspicious gathering. Every city has its secret veils, and I am honored by this one's select parting. Of course, I realize that many of you might see me as cut from the same cloth as your avowed enemy, but I assure you this is not the case. You have expressed your concern as regards the influx of priests of the Panyan Daman into Saltoan. They speak of cities newly come under the divine protection of the Panion Seer's cult and offer to the common people tales of laws applied impartially to all citizens, of rights and inscripted privileges, of the welcome imposition of order in defiance of local traditions and manners. They sow seeds of discord among your subjects, a dangerous precedent indeed. Murmurs of agreement followed from the masters and mistresses. Gruntle glanced over and saw Nectara's hand plunged beneath the leather folds of Stani's leggings at the crotch. Stani's face was flushed, a faint smile on her lips, her eyes almost closed. Gruntle thought, Queen of Dreams, no wonder nine-tenths of the men in this room are panting, not to mention drinking deep from their cups of wine. He himself reached for his tankard. One of the mistresses growled, A wholesale slaughter. Every damned one of them priests should be belly smiling. That's the only way to deal with this, I say. Karuli said, Martyrs to the faith. Such a direct attack is doomed to fail, as it has in other cities. 
This conflict is one of information, lords and ladies, or rather, misinformation. The priests are conducting a campaign of deception. The Panion Daman, for all its imposition of law and order, is a tyranny, characterized by extraordinary levels of cruelty to its people. No doubt you have heard tales of the Teniscauri, the seer's army of the dispossessed and the abandoned. All that you may have heard is without exaggeration. Cannibals of the dead. One man interjected, children of the dead seed. It is true? Is it even possible that women should descend onto battlefields and soldiers whose corpses are not yet cold? Kiruli's nod was somber. He said, among the Teniscauri's youngest generation of followers, I, there are the children of the dead seed. Singular proof of what is possible. When the Teniscauri horde were introduced, we mentioned that they weren't the worst thing to come out of the Panion Daman. This concept of the children of the Dead Seed is truly horrific. Yes, it is. I don't know how much that's always stuck with you, because I think that's one of the main first things you ever mentioned about this book. You said, what did you get the Teniscauri? That's just going to really gnarly, and it's like, and it does. I know it bothers you to this day. Yeah, this just takes that and cranks it to 11, though. <laughs> yeah. Maybe even higher, because yeah. it's just so disgusting. Yeah, I think it's a 12. <laughs> Kiruli paused, then continued. The Daman possesses its sanctified faithful, the citizens of the original Panion cities, to whom all the rights and privileges the priests speak of applies. No one else can acquire that citizenship. Non-citizens are less than slaves, for they are the subjects, the objects of every cruelty conceivable, without recourse to mercy or justice. The Teniscauri offers their only escape the chance to match the inhumanity inflicted on them. The citizens of Saltoan, should the Daman subjugate this city, will be one and all cast from their homes, stripped of all possessions, denied food, denied clean water. Savagery will be their only possible path, as followers sworn into the Teniscauri. A kingdom with a populace that produces nothing, no children, no goods. They only devour and move on. It really makes me wonder at the overall strategy here. Is there a strategy or is it just a mindless kind of moving from one resource to the other, just looking for the next biggest thing to feed the people on top, loot them and just move on? It's almost like a wildfire. Yeah. It just burns everything in its path as it keeps going. There's nothing left. Yeah. You either go with them as the tennis gallery or you stay and are killed. I mean, there's really doesn't sound like there's anything to it. Yeah, you know, I, don't, I don't think there's cities left when they're done. <laughs> right. Kuruli continued, Masters and mistresses, we must fight this war with the weapon of truth, the laying bare of the lies of the Panion priests. This demands a very specific kind of organization, of dissemination, of crafted rumors and counterintelligence, tasks at which you all excel, my friends. The city's commonality must themselves drive the priests from Saltoan. They must be guided to that decision, to that cause, not with fists and knouts, but with words. Uh, kind of like the Bene Gesserit. <laughs> In a way, yes, where they plant those seeds. Yeah. But they're taking generations to do this, whereas this seems to be an active misinformation campaign. Oh, yeah. Where they are getting the public turned against the priests preemptively so that when they get there, the public themselves just reject them outright. Right. It's good thinking. Yeah. Someone demanded, what makes you so sure that will work? Karuli said, you have no choice but to make it work. To fail is to see Saltoan fall to the Panions. Kiruli continued, but Gruntel was no longer listening. His eyes, half shut, studied the man who had hired them. An intermediary had brokered the contract in Darujistan. Gruntel's first sight of Kiruli was the morning outside Worry Gate, at the rendezvous, arriving on foot, robed as he was now. The carriage was delivered scant moments after him, of local hire. Kiruli had quickly entered it, and from then on Gruntel had seen and spoken with his master but twice on this long, wearying journey. Gruntel thought, a mage I'd concluded, but now, I think, a priest, kneeling before which god, I wonder. No obvious signs. That itself is telling enough, I suppose. There's nothing obvious about Karuli, except maybe the bottomless coin chest backing his generosity. Any new temples in Darujistan lately? Can't recall. Oh, that one in Gadrobi district. Sanctified to Treach, though why anyone would be interested in worshipping the Tiger of Summer is beyond me. Gruntel heard the word killings, which broke him out of his thoughts. Someone said, been quiet these two nights past, though. The masters and mistresses were speaking amongst themselves. Karuli's attention was nevertheless keen, though he said nothing. Blinking, Gruntel eased slightly straighter on the bench. He leaned close to Harlow and asked, what was that about killings? Harlow said, unexplained murders for four nights running, or something like that. A local problem, though I gather it's past. Gruntel grunted, then settled back once again, trying to ignore the cool sweat now prickling beneath his shirt. He thought, they made good time, well ahead of us. 
that carriage moved with preternatural speed, but it would never have managed Saltoan's streets. Too wide, too high. Must have camped in Waytown, a score of paces from Sunrise Gate. Proof of your convictions, friend Buke? Later, Stani said, I was bored out of my mind. What do you think? She poured herself another cup of wine and went on. Nectara managed to alleviate that. And if all those sweating hairy faces were any indication, not just for me. You're all pigs, Gruntle said. Wasn't us on such public display. Stani said, so what? You didn't all have to watch, did you? What if it had been a baby on my hip and my tit bared? Harlow said, if that, I would have positively stared. <laughs> Stani said, you're disgusting. Harlow added, you misunderstand me, dearest. Not your tit, though that would be a fine sight indeed. But you with a baby. Ha! A baby! <laughs> Stani threw him a sneer. Seriously, what did she expect? Privacy in a public place? This is a case where I'm going to have to watch what I say. So, <clears throat> help me. <laughs> um, <clears throat> she is aware. She's obviously aware. Anyone with half a brain knows it, and she knows because of the way she treats these men. This is obviously deliberate. What we kind of mentioned a little bit before I'll bring up in here, too. Stoney is, is, is about as white trash as you get, <laughs> especially here in Woo tonight. You know, <laughs> she's really been on display for all to see. Now, I'm assuming she's a great fighter, but she's a real piece of work. And I'm not besmirching her as a fighter or a loyalty, just her comportment. She is in great company, though. The Malaysian universe has some of my favorite trash. I mean, there is some great trash here, but none as nasty as her. I mean, her nasty attitude is just nasty. I can't stand that kind of attitude. The way she talks to everybody, I think I said this before, so I'm probably repeating myself, but why would you keep somebody around that treats everybody so badly? She has just got to be one heck of a fighter. And just got to be loyal as all get out. It's the only thing I could think of. Maybe we'll find out more. Yes. In the future. I'm hoping. <laughs> but your mention of this class of individual <laughs> reminded me of a meme I saw. <laughs> where it was two people making out in an apartment complex parking lot with basically this going on. And it had some hilarious caption. But fundamentally, it was... <laughs> Okay. Exactly as you described okay. it, you know. <laughs> do, do you have time for a Fry's 18 story? Do we have time for a Fry's 18 story? There's always time for a Fry's story, Billy. Exactly. And our beloved Fry's in Dallas, Fry's number 18, I was lost prevention and we had cameras and we had really nice camera system in the outside parking lot. And Fry's, strangely enough, was a place where people would come and hook up. And they'd hook up right in the middle of the day or the night. They just didn't care. I mean, people were just pretty awful. And you know how we close is the, the LP guy leaves first and does the lap around the building and then lets everyone know. So this is summertime. We had closed at like six or seven on Sunday. I forget what it was. And we, you know, it's one of these things. It's daylight. And there's a couple going at it next to my car. <laughs> and so, so I get in the car and I drive around and I tell everyone, you know, and it, come on, this is summer. You you know, it's a hundred and it's a hundred. Oh it's all, it's a oh, hundred degrees yeah. minimal. Oh, now man. they're in the shade, mind you, but it's that was it's, sweaty. Oh, in there. so the windows are open, okay? So and this is a we have ten people we're going out with. <laughs> so I say, okay. By the way, everyone, as y'all walk past, make sure and try not to look at the couple having sex in the car right there in front of you. And of course, everyone does. And uh, there we go. <laughs> that is crazy. <laughs> That was a huge parking lot, too. Uh, yeah, it went on a lot, dude. It went on a lot. One real quick thing that I just remembered, I completely forgot about this. When we used to have to open, the manager walks up, and there, generally there's five, six people yeah. there waiting. Yeah. And then we have to have a certain number of people before we go in the building, if I remember yes. correctly. I think it was one Saturday morning when I normally opened. I go, and they have those metal poles that pe keep people from running into the building with their cars. Bollards. <laughs> yeah the bollard yeah the closest one to the door there was this huge hawk perched on it staring at me and i, oh, wow. I was afraid to approach because it, this is like five six feet from the door and wow. it wouldn't leave <laughs> and finally i kind of edged <laughs> over to the door and i think it finally took off but i was worried it was going to start attacking me with its talons or something right. <laughs> oh that would have been i'm sorry that's amazing all right Moving on from Fry's 18 stories. Yes. They were sitting in a back room in the tavern, the leavings of a meal on the table between them. Gruntle sighed and said, in any case, that meeting will last the rest of the night. And come the morning, our master will be the only one among us privileged to catch up on his sleep in the comfy confines of his carriage. We've got rooms upstairs with almost clean beds, and I suggest we make use of them. 
Harlow said, that would be to actually sleep, dearest Stani. <laughs> Stani reported, rest assured, I'll bar the door, runt. Harlow said, Nectara has a secret knock, presumably. Stani warned, wipe that grin off your face or I'll do it for you, Harlow. Harlow asked, how come you get all the fun anyway? She grinned and said, breeding mongrel. What I got and you ain't got. Harlow said, education too, huh? Stani said, precisely. <laughs> Man, looks is one thing, but you have to be able to stand them to keep them around. And with an attitude like this, who finds her attractive? I just don't get it. I hope we see a different side of her because it's funny. I'm starting off. And, I mean, I, I don't recall not liking her this much, but her treatment of her friends is a it's it's a real big negative for me. And uh, it is kind of a trigger for me because I how people treat friends, people how I treat my friends. <laughs> earns my wrath you know so it's like you got to be careful so i don't like how she treats her friends if this is how you treat the people you love how are you gonna treat mm. everybody else <laughs> right wow it's a good question sir a moment later the door swung open and cruelly entered gruntle leaned back in his chair and eyed the priest he asked so have you succeeded in recruiting the city's thugs murderers and extortionists to your cause cruelly said more or less war alas must be fought on more than one kind of battlefield the campaign will be a long one i fear Gruntle asked, is that why we're headed to Kapistan? Karuli's gaze settled on Gruntle for a moment. Then he turned away and said, I have other tasks awaiting me there, Captain. Our brief detour here in Saltoan is incidental in the great scheme of things. Gruntle thought, and which great scheme is that, priest? He wanted to ask, but didn't. Karuli was beginning to make him nervous, and he suspected that any answer to that question would only make matters worse. He thought, no, Karuli, you keep your secrets. Smart man. <laughs> <laughs> The archway beneath Sunrise Gate was as dark as a tomb, the air chill and damp. Waytown's shanty sprawl was visible just beyond, through a haze of smoke-lit gold by the morning sun. Gruntle nudged his horse into an easy trot as soon as he rode into the sunlight. He'd remained in Saltoan, lingering around the gate for two bells, whilst Harlow and Stani had driven the carriage and Karuli out of the city a bell before dawn. They would be at least two leagues along the river road, he judged. Most of the banditry on the first half of this stretch to Kapistan was headquartered in Saltoan. The stretch's second half, in Kapan territory, was infinitely safer. Spotters hung around Sunrise Gate to mark the caravans heading east, much as he'd seen their counterparts on the west wall at Sunset Gate keeping an eye out for caravans bound for Darujistan. Gruntle had waited to see if any local packs had made plans for Karuli's party, but no one had set out in pursuit, confirming the master's assertion that safe passage had been guaranteed. It wasn't in Gruntle's nature to take thieves at their word, however. That's pretty impressive that he takes his job so seriously, and he's seemingly very good at it. Yes. And again, this is another thing, getting to, getting to know Gruntle again. I missed some of this diligence before, and how, yeah, it's very impressive, especially for what he is. He worked his horse into a canter to escape Waytown's cloud of flies and, flanked by half-wild barking dogs, rode clear of the shanty town and onto the open, rocky river road. Vision Plains' gently rolling prairie reached out to the distant Bargast range on his left. To his right lay the reedy flats of the river's floodplain. The dogs abandoned him a few hundred paces beyond Waytown, and Gruntle found himself alone on the road. The trader track would fade before long, he recalled. There was no chance of getting lost, of course, so long as one kept Catlin River within sight to the south. He came upon the corpses less than a league further on. The highwaymen had perfectly positioned their ambush, emerging from a deeply cut seasonal stream bed and no doubt surrounding their victim's carriage in moments. The precise planning hadn't helped, it seemed. Two or three days old at the most, bloated and almost black under the sun, their bodies were scattered to both sides of the track. Swords, lance heads, buckles, and anything else that was metal had all melted under some ferocious heat, yet clothing and leather bindings were unmarked. A number of the bandits wore spurs, and indeed there would have been no way of getting out this far without horses, but of the beasts there was no sign. Dismounted and wandering among the dead, Gruntle noted that the tracks of Karuli's carriage, they too had stopped to examine the scene, were overlaying another set, a wider, heavier carriage drawn by oxen. There were no visible wounds on the corpses. Gruntle thought, I doubt Buke had to even so much as draw his blade. He climbed back into his saddle and resumed his journey. He caught sight of his companions half a league further on and rode up alongside the carriage a short while later. Harlow gave him a nod and said, A fine day, wouldn't you say, Gruntle? Gruntle said, Not a cloud in the sky. Where's Stani? Harlow said, Took one of the horses ahead. Should be back soon. Gruntle asked, Why'd she do that? Harlow said, Just wanted to make certain the wayside camp was, uh, unoccupied. Ah, here she comes. Gruntle greeted her with a scowl as she reined in before them. He said, Damn stupid thing to do, woman. 
Stani said, this whole journey's stupid if you ask me. There's three Bargus at the wayside camp, and no, they ain't roasted any bandits lately. Anyway, Kapistan's bare days away from a siege. Maybe we make the walls in time, in which case we'll be stuck there with the whole Panyan army between us and the open road, or we don't make it in time and those damn tennis gallery have fun with us. Gruntle's scowl deepened. He asked, where are those Bargas headed then? Stani said, they came down from the north, but now they're traveling the same as us. They want to take a look at things closer to Kapistan, and don't ask me why. They're Bargast, ain't they? Brains the size of walnuts. We got to talk with the master, Gruntle. <laughs> so it's not just trots. <laughs> so I take it that the Bargast are perceived as kind of dim here. So is this due to their dis- they don't talk a whole lot? Or We only have trots for reference up to this point, don't we? Correct. I don't think we've met too many others. No. The carriage door swung open and cruelly climbed out. He said, no need, Stani Manakis. My hearing is fine. Three Bargast, you said. Which clan? Stani said, Whiteface, if the paint's any indication. Kiruli said, we shall invite them to travel with us then. Gruntle said, Master, but Kiruli cut him off and said, we shall arrive in Kapistan well before the siege, I believe. The Septarch responsible for the Panyan forces is known for a methodical approach. Once I am delivered, your duties will be discharged and you will be free to leave immediately for Darujistan. You do not have a reputation for breaking contracts, else I would not have hired you. Gruntle said, no, sir, we've no intention of breaking our contract. Nonetheless, it might be worth discussing our options. What if Kapustan is besieged before we arrive? Kuruli said, then I shall not see you lose your lives in any desperate venture, Captain. I need then only be dropped off outside the range of the enemy, and I shall make my own way into the city. And such subterfuge is best attempted alone. Gruntle asked, you would attempt to pass through the Panyan cordon? Cruelly smiled and said, I have relevant skills for such an undertaking. Gruntle thought, do you now? He asked, what about these Bargast? What makes you think they can be trusted to travel in our company? Cruelly said, if untrustworthy, better they be in sight than out of it. Wouldn't you agree, Captain? Gruntle grunted and said, you've a point there, Master. He faced Harlow and Stani, then slowly nodded. Harlow offered him a resigned smile. <laughs> Stani was, predictably, not so nearly laconic. She tossed up her hands and exclaimed, this is insanity. Fine, then. We ride into the dragon's maw. Why not? She spun her horse around and said, let's go throw bones with the bargast, shall we? Grimacing, Gruntle watched her ride off. Harlow murmured, she is a treasure, is she not? Gruntle gave him a sidelong glance and said, never seen you so love-struck before. Harlow said, it's the unattainable, friend. That's what's done for me. <laughs> I long helplessly, morosely, maundering over, over unrequited adoration. I dream of her and Nectara with oh, me man. snug between them. Oh, poor Harlow. Oh, but it is, <laughs> oh, it's the unattainable thing that makes me laugh. It's like saving Silverman. Steve Zahn is in, is the, he's the one that falls in love with, with, with the woman they kidnap because she's so mean. <laughs> he just, he's drawn to the same thing. He's drawn to the mean woman. Uh-huh. He wants to break though. That's the difference. It's like, he wants to break them. You, know? you think he can save her? Yes. That's what it is. <laughs> Gruntle said, please, Harlow, you're making me sick. Kiruli said, um, I believe I shall now return to the carriage. <laughs> <laughs> I guess the priest isn't used to talking like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's it. The three Bargas were clearly siblings, with the woman the eldest. White paint had been smeared on their faces, giving them a skull-like appearance. Braids stained with red ochre, ochre. hung down to their shoulders, <laughs> knotted with bone fetishes. <laughs> All three wore <laughs> hauberks of hold coins, the currency ranging from copper to silver and no doubt from some looted hoard, as most of them looked ancient and unfamiliar to Gruntle's eye. Coin-backed gauntlets covered their hands. A guard block's worth of weapons accompanied the trio. Bundled lances, throwing axes, and copper-sheathed long-hafted fighting axes, hook-bladed swords, and assorted knives and daggers. That armor is interesting. I bet it looks really cool, but it also seems like it would be really heavy. Oh, yeah, I agree with both. And I think it would be heavy, especially depending on what kind of metals. Any lead or gold, of course, is going to be heavier. But yeah, that would be really heavy. But you know it looks cool, though. Oh, yeah. Also, the number of weapons they're carrying. Yeah. It's pretty (laughs) crazy. It's a whole arsenal. Yeah, they're enthusiastic. (laughs) (laughs) I don't seem to remember the Segula having this many weapons. No, but the Segula are different. But at the same time, the Bargast are pretty fierce. At least for everything we hear about them, people seem to be kind of leery of them. So I'm sense a fierceness to this folk as well they almost seem like barbarians don't they yeah they do i like that about them yeah i get a whole heavy metal vibe from them oh yeah absolutely dude. it's all conan <laughs> and heavy metal dude that's all it is it's, it's straight up that's what the bargast are for me dude 
<laughs> the bar guest stood on the other side of a small stone ringed fire pit burned down to faintly smoldering coals with Stani still seated on her horse to their left. A small heap of jackrabbit bones indicated the meal just completed. Gruntle's gaze settled on the bar guest woman. He said, our master invites you to travel in our company. Do you accept? The woman's dark eyes flicked to the carriage as Harlow drove it to the camp's edge. After a moment, she said, few traders still journey to Kapistan. The trail has become perilous. Gruntle frowned and asked, how so? Had the Panyans sent raiding parties across the river? The woman said, not that we have heard. No, demons stalk the wildlands. We have been sent to discover the truth of them. Gruntle thought, demons? Hood's breath. He asked, when did you learn of these demons? She shrugged and said, two, three months passed. Gruntle sighed and slowly dismounted. He said, well, let us hope there's nothing to such tales. The woman grinned and said, we hope otherwise. I am Hetan, and these are my miserable brothers, Kafal and Natak. This is Natak's first hunt since his death night. I assume this is one of those rites of passage where they would bury you for a night, then dig you up. Do you agree that it's something like that? Yes, and I'm assuming there's a pretty hefty dose of some powerful hallucinogen before they throw you in that overnight burial spot. Oh, yeah. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> Gruntle glanced at the glowering, hulking youth and said, I can see his excitement. Hitan turned, gaze narrowing on her brother. She said, you must have sharp eyes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so maybe not that smart. <laughs> Gruntle thought, by the abyss, another humorless woman for company. <laughs> they just don't get their humor. They just don't get our humor, man. <laughs> Looping a leg over her saddle, Stani dropped to the ground. She said, our captain's too obvious with his jokes, Hattan. They end up thudding like ox dung and smelling just as foul. Pay him no mind, lass, unless you enjoy being confused. Hattan growled, I enjoy killing and riding men and little else, <laughs> and crossed her muffled arms. Harlow quickly clambered down from the carriage and approached her with a broad smile. He said, I am named Harlow, and I'm delighted to make your acquaintance, Hattan. <laughs> He's going for it. Oh. Stani drawled, you can kill him anytime you like. <laughs> the two brothers were indeed miserable creatures, taciturn and, as far as Gruntle could determine, singularly thick. Harlow's futile efforts with Hattan proved amusing enough whilst they sat around the rekindled hearth. Karuli made a brief appearance shortly before everyone began bedding down, but only to share a bowl of herbal tea before once again retiring to his carriage. It fell to Gruntle, he and Hattan, the last two lingering at the fire pit, to pry loose more information from the bar guest. Gruntle said, these demons, how have they been described? She leaned forward and ritually spat into the fire. She said, well, hold on, spitting? Yes. Huh. <laughs> Where have we seen that before? Oh, I, I, <laughs> it's been I, a while since I thought of that. <laughs> she said, fast on two legs, talons like an eagle's, only much larger, at the ends of those legs. Their arms are blades. Gruntle asked, blades? What do you mean? Hitan shrugged and said, bladed, blood iron. Their eyes are hollow pits. They stink of urns in the dark circle. They make no sound, no sound at all. Gruntle thought, urns in the dark circle? Cremation urns in a chamber barrow. Ah, they smell of death then. Their arms are blades. How? What in Hood's name does that mean? Blood iron. That's iron quenched in snow chilled blood. A bargas practice when shamans invest weapons. Thus, the wielder and the weapon are linked, merged. Gruntle asked, has anyone in your clan seen one? Hitan said, no, the demons have not journeyed north to our mountain fastnesses. They remain in these grasslands. Gruntle asked, who then delivered the tales? Hitan said, our shoulder men have seen them in their dreams. The spirits whisper to them and warn them of the threat. The white clan has chosen a war chief, our father, and await what is to come. But our father would know his enemy, so he has sent his children down onto the flatlands. And that's quite the contrast in behavior to foppish nobility. That's extremely impressive. I like that a lot. And hey, what's funny, I never thought about this till just as we were coming to this. Isn't it interesting that these two different racial groups, the Segula, have a three-man scouting team out here? And the Bargas has sent a three-man scouting team out here. I think this is a pretty scary indicator of something of the fight that's coming i did think about that a little bit the similarity between the two particularly they got this whole arsenal yeah. with them hey, they're, it's <laughs> better to have and not need than need and not have yeah <laughs> i forgot my mace at home dad come it <laughs> <laughs> gruntle ruminated on this his eyes watching the fire slowly ebb 
He said, Will your father, the war chief of the White Faces, lead the clan south? If Kapistan is besieged, the Capan territories will be vulnerable to your raids, at least until the Panyans complete their conquest. Hitan said, Our father has no plans to lead us south, Captain. She spat a second time into the fire and continued, The Panyan war will come to us in time. So the shoulder men have read in veteran blades. Then there shall be war. Gruntle said, If these demons are advanced elements of the Panyan's forces, Hitan said, Then, when they first appear in our fastnesses, we will know that the time has come. Gruntle muttered, Fighting, what you enjoy the most. Hitan said, Yes, but for now, I would ride you. <laughs> well, that's a little forward. Pretty bold. Well, she did say that that's what she enjoys, so... <laughs> <laughs> little jarring after <laughs> coming from Jerusalem, yes. where it's a little bit different. Yes. More similar to our culture. Yes, more Western. <laughs> it's East meets West. <laughs> Gruntle thought, ride? More like batter me senseless. Ah, oh, well. <laughs> he said, what man would say no to such an elegant offer? Collecting her bedroll in both arms, Hitan rose and said, follow me and hurry. Gruntle said, alas, I never hurry, as you're about to discover. Hitan said, tomorrow night, I shall ride your friend. <laughs> Gruntle said, you're doing so tonight, dear, in his dreams. She nodded seriously and said, he has big hands. Gruntle said, I. She noted, so do you. Gruntle <laughs> said, I thought you were in a hurry, Hitan. She said, I am. Let's go. <sighs> All right, we're going to stop there this week, and we will finish out the chapter next week. Yeah. For standout moments. The introduction to Sal Toen and the backstory surrounding the reason the canal had been built. I appreciate that level of detail. Yes, agreed. And there's, it's just one of those. We, it's funny because you and I tend to hone in on a lot of these details on these read throughs in particular, where it's like, you know, it's this kind of stuff right here that really, really sells the reality of this world. These small things that most other writers would leave out and not even worry about giving to you. Yeah. It reminds me of an interview. Tell me if I talked about this before on the podcast. It was Quentin Tarantino. He was talking about how he convinced Robert De Niro to work with him on Jackie Brown. Did I tell this story? I don't before? know. You remember I, this? I, I don't recall okay. this. So the level of detail that he goes into oh. when he creates these characters. So he's talking about the character Lewis. The guy was in jail. And he's telling a story about how Lewis wears these leather loafers. But one of them, it's crumpled because he was wearing them when he got booked in jail and when they put his belongings in the bag all of the belongings were on top of it and it crushed the toe of the shoe this is the level of detail i equate that to how yeah. mr erickson does his world building yeah where he's thinking of how things got to where they are what happened to make them turn into what they are today it's awesome basically. yeah i like that just like quentin Tarantino is a master at creating these characters that's the level that i think Mr. Erickson has in his world building. It's that epic. It is. I agree wholeheartedly. <laughs> I don't want to say that I enjoyed this, but the introduction of the children of the dead seed, it's it memorable. leaves <laughs> such a large impression on me. It's one of those horrific core memories from this book. Yes. It's a good horrific core memory because it, again, you and I are drawn to a good villainous type of, thing that's going on and this is sure is leading off to something that's pretty horrendous sounding and so it's like i'm kind of curious to see the leadership behind this yeah what's going on why are the teniscari yeah throwing everything in their path yeah. with no plans for the future yeah exactly there's no tomorrow <laughs> the introduction of the bar guest hitan mm -hmm. kafal and natak i love that we're fine because this is one that we've been hinting at bar gas it's been alluded to in the past two books and we have of course trots a kind of a more, shall we say, civilized podcast. <laughs> one of the one of the more molasses type mm -hmm. fellows. But uh, it, it's nice to meet this other tribal group because it was. I always love so much of Mr. Erickson's tribal groups are so it's so in, distinctive. From the Reevee, you know, to these kind of people, it's like I like getting to know these people, and so I'm, I look forward to more of the of the bar guest. Yeah, it is cool to see a completely new culture appear yes. that we really don't know a lot about, and get to learn about their customs yeah. and how they live. That's really cool. Yeah, and then along with that, we have Hatan's masculinity mm. and forwardness. Yes. <laughs> yes. I appreciate the forwardness. I can, I mean, it's, uh, I would have to say no, now that I'm a married man, but I, it's the, you know, I love the forwardness of these people. I'm assuming that a lot of these folks are this way in this, uh, the, the bar guest. I mean, 
I'm assuming that's just that's just culture for these folks. You know, just speak it. <laughs> it's a little bit too much for me. <laughs> it, it, it's a, it's a little too much for me too. It makes me uncomfortable. But I was like, who am I to say? You know, I'm just gonna just gonna step over here and be kind of just like quiet and observe. <laughs> I did appreciate Harlow's pathetic attempts to capitalize <laughs> on her forward. <laughs> hey, by the way, I'm Harlow. <laughs> so, yeah. How you doing? <laughs> say, say what's going on. <laughs> we didn't really linger on this very much but her description of these demons oh, yeah. that are on the planes i'm looking really forward to this yeah i was thinking about this it's like the three blind men describing an elephant yeah you have no idea what this creature is at this point yeah you don't it's got talons blades dead eyes what yeah. is going on here it smells Stinks like death, death. what yeah. is it it's wild dude it's absolutely wild yeah. all right you got any final thoughts before we drop off here? Great episode, man. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Looking forward to next week when we start digging into seeing, hopefully we'll get into what these demons actually are. Looking forward to that. Yeah. Great job tonight. Hey, great episode, man. All right. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next week. We'll see you all next week. We thank you all for joining us today. Again, we'd really like to thank you for taking the time to be with us. And we've had a really great time talking about the topic today. If you would like to support our show, you can find us at horsefrogproductions.com, where you can find our Patreon link. Depending on the platform you're listening from, it may also be in the episode description. And if you'd like to contact us uh, through email, it's at contact at horsefrogproductions.com. Mm-hmm.